35 and the blue book invitation is on the first of May. Scott 35. <coughs> Well, good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Today I want to talk a little bit about how to love God more deeply. We need to love God with all our heart, with all our mind, and with all our soul. And that, that includes our praise, our love, our service. We need to have all of our mind and all of our soul dedicated to Christ. And this is going to be a lesson um, about a lot of concepts that you guys have down. A lot of concepts that you've heard over and over. But this is a time to self-evaluate. This is a time to, to think about God and how in your life, when can you apply these loving aspects? That might be at work. And you might be saying, wow, my love for God is sinking low. What can I do to pick up my love for God? That might be singing with songs and hymns in your hearts while you're at work. You might be shoveling away, or you might be typing away, and you might be going, bless his assurance, and you might be singing away. And you might be loving God wherever you are. You might be for a, on a walk. And you might be singing, low in the grave he lay. You know, you might be singing away. You might be praising God. When it says sing in, hum, in songs and hymns in your heart, is that just during the service? No, that's all the time. We've got this spirit in us. And we've got this fire in us. We've got the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. And that should develop this very deep and fervent love for God. It should be stirred around in you all the time. And we need to stoke that love. And there's certain things that we can do to deepen that love. And that's what I want to talk about today. Um, and the first question I have for you is, who is your best friend? I want you to think right now, who is your best friend? Who's the first person that comes to mind? Uh, it's funny, the first time I preached this lesson, I said, well, it's Kevin's. You know, like, my friend Kirsten goes, you didn't pick me. <laughs> you jerk, you know? <laughs> it's like, it's like, you're my wife, you're more than a friend, right? Uh, <laughs> Uh, so you might say, who is your best friend? And really, Jesus, he's your best friend. He's your best friend. So it's a trick question. Uh, I was kind of setting you guys up. If, if one of you guys picked Jesus, whew, you're on the right track. You could probably walk out right now. You've got it. Um, in John chapter 15, verse 9, it says, As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Con continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments... You shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Verse 14, get this, he says, Ye are my friends. If you do, if ye do whatsoever I command you, so there's a there's a caveat there. You, just, you need to do what he what he commands. If you love him, you'll do his commandments, and he calls us his friends. What an intimate and beautiful word that he can treat us with, and say that you are my friends. If you think of your best friend, Jesus is more than that. He's infinitely better than your best friend, and he is your best friend. He loves you that much. And that's got to be one of my favorite verses of all time. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And I think you can imagine the one that you love, uh, maybe your kids, your wife, whoever it might be. You might just say, you know, I think Stephanie would do the same thing for Calvin. If she saw him on the railroad tracks and he wasn't paying attention, I think she would have pushed it off and let the train hit her. I know she would. Um, if you love somebody that much, there's no greater love than that, than to, than to push that person out of the way and let that train hit you, right? And that's what Jesus did for us. He took, that, he took the hit for us. He took the hit for our sins. He took the hit for all the, the, the ways that we've fallen short. That is a friend. That is the, the, the most beautiful word for a friend. And to know a little bit more about how to love God more deeply, I mentioned we, we have the Spirit in us. We have this fire in us, the Holy Spirit, right? We need to understand His role dwelling within us. And it's not just comforting. He's got many, many roles within us. John chapter 16, verse 7. We'll start our journey of talking about the Holy Spirit here. John chapter 16, verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. 
And then uh, also if you go down to John 14, verse 16, it says, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Then verse 17 of John 14, Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, uh, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. And get this, this is the key verse I want to, I want to sit, talk about here. It's verse 18. Listen closely to this one. It says, so Jesus has just told them, this is the context. He's just said, I'm going to leave you. I'm going to die on this cross. I'm going to leave you so that he may come. This dynamic of God is going to shift. He is going to leave so the Holy Spirit may be with us. And that's where we're living in. He is left so the Holy Spirit is dwelling within us. But get this. Listen to this verse, verse 18. He says, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Interesting, huh? He said, I'm going to leave you, but I'm going to come to you. And you're like, wait a minute, Jesus, you're going that way. What are you talking about? Why are you saying that I'm going to come to you? What he's saying is here, is he's saying the Holy Spirit, it's so intimate with him. It's just one with him. He's saying that is fully God. The Holy Spirit is coming. He even claims it as I. I comes in three. I is the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That is God. They are three, and this is just a reminder so if you have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, these are three separate persons. The Holy Spirit is not the Father. The Holy Spirit is not the Son. The Son is not the Holy Spirit. The Son is not the Father. The Father is not the Holy Spirit. The Father is not the Son. They are separate. And we know that at his baptism, when God the Father from above, he talks about, uh, here's my Son in whom I'm well pleased. The Holy Spirit descends like a dove. Don't let people tell you that they are, they are the same. They are separate. They are absolutely separate. So that's the beauty of the Son saying, I'm going this way, but I will come to you. He is claiming this Holy Spirit. He's saying, I need a part so he may come. When he's talking explicitly about the Holy Spirit. Some people will deny to you that the Holy Spirit is fully God. It's an absolute, complete uh, falsity that has occurred, including in the Church of Christ. This is something that we cannot accept. The Holy Spirit is fully God. If Jesus is claiming it as I, this is 100%, 100% God. And we cannot deny that. And if you do deny that, we know what happens to those people that deny the Holy Spirit. Those people who blaspheme the Holy Spirit, it says there's no sacrifice left for that person. So we need to accept that it's 100% God. We need to realize that it is within us. We are the temple of the Lord. We are not going to tarnish this body that is containing this thing. And that will develop your deepening for love for Christ. That will deepen your love for the Father. That will deepen your love for the Holy Spirit. That will deepen your love for God. Recognizing the beauty of the Trinity. He is within us. And in fact, there's another verse which talks about, and we will make our abode with him. We will make our abode with him. When it talks about God, God is plural and singular. This is fully God. This is fully God. This is fully God. But they are separate. They're separate. It's kind of like how we are viewing the world. I think I've talked about this maybe a year or two ago when I talked about it in a Trinity lesson. How it's like we're looking at the world like it's a square. But in the spiritual world, in the way that God sees the world, it's like looking at a cube. And sorry if I can't draw this on the spot. Oh dear, here we go. Okay, but it turned out. <laughs> um, that's like, it's, it's, it's the difference between looking at a square for us. This is how we view the whole world. This is all we can see. What is physical? And then for God, there's a whole other spiritual spiritual world that I'll admit I know very little about. <laughs> I know very little about those things. I don't know if there's an angel sitting there. I don't know if he's over at Sefco. I don't know. I don't know, where, I don't know where these angels are at. I don't know where these spirits are at. I do think there is examples in, in Revelations that talks about how there's the stars that were left in different churches. It talks about those stars, and it defines it as angels. So there is uh, certain hints. I don't know if we're that blessed to be the, 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 Milano, the Milano star here. I don't know if, if, that, if, that, if we've got one, but um, that's not the, the main point of this lesson here. Um, and so the, the, the next thing is to say what the Holy Spirit does. And to me, realizing what's in us and working within us and recognizing what he can do is much more than just a comfort. Because Jesus calls him the comfort, but he's so much more. He's so much more. And John 14, 26, it refers to him as that comforter. It also refers to him as a teacher of all things. He comforts us. It's like he's hugging us. I don't know if you've ever felt that when you were down in the dumps and, and, and then you pray to God and you just feel this calm and peace about you. I'm convinced that's the Holy Spirit just giving you a nice big hug, huh? Maybe not like exactly like that, 
but he is comforting you. He is taking care of you. He's looking after you. And I'm not saying to live your spiritual life only off of feelings. That's a dangerous way to live your life, because if you ate the hamburger, you might feel real nice. Or maybe you didn't make it feel too nice, and then you're like, oh, what a bummer. You know, if you ate some nasty food before you came to church, you're like, man, Nathan was rough today, and my stomach didn't like that at all. Um, and that's not what we're trying to get at. So he's a comforter. He's a teacher of all things. And that's very interesting here. Um, a teacher of all things. And I'm not going to say I fully understand the Holy Spirit's role within us and how he can teach. Um, something I was talking about uh, with an individual was, how do we know when the Holy Spirit's speaking within us and speaking through us? Very interesting question. It really is. Um, and what I told that person is they said, you should know when you are speaking up here, you should know that the Holy Spirit is 100% speaking through you. And I said, whoa, that's pretty bold. <laughs> so I said, well, what the flaw in that is when I trip on my words, was that me or the Holy Spirit? God's perfect, isn't he? <laughs> He's not going to trip on his words. Amen. Here's what the deal is. We've got this imperfect vessel, and God's doing the best he can. Right? God's working through us. Uh, I, you know, I, to, to what degree? I don't know. You know, if, if, I'm, uh, if my heart's in the wrong place, maybe it's just all Nathan today. Maybe, maybe he's just like, you know what? Uh, your measure's not as full, right? So it talks about Jesus. He says he has the Holy Spirit beyond measure. It actually gives him an amount. So if this is the scale of how much Holy Spirit you can have, Jesus is up here, right? Nathan's down here. <laughs> Maybe this is the amount of Holy Spirit I get right here compared to Jesus. There's a degree of Holy Spirit, and I'm convinced you can stoke that fire when you can feel it by reading and praising God, singing songs and hymns in your heart. And maybe after doing that, maybe I'm a little bit up here. I don't know. I don't know fully how he works in our lives. But I do know that feeling of when you pray to God and he hugs you and he looks after you and he's comforting you. Oh, that feels so good. And I'm telling you, there's no mistake in that. I get chills just thinking about it. I don't know how many times you guys have experienced that kind of feeling. Um, I'll tell you what, when that guy this, this, uh, this uh, morning was getting baptized, man, I'm a grown man and it put me to tears. <laughs> oh, that was so beautiful. That man goes up there and he wants to be baptized and I, and I can just, I felt like I could just look in the corners of the room and see an angel sitting there. It just felt so awe oh, and I can't talk too much. I'm going to start crying right now. It's just Oh, that's, that is so beautiful. That is a soul saved for Christ. If you want to deepen your love, oh, go to a baptism. Oh my goodness, that, that makes you feel so good. That will really deepen your love. And I talked with the guy a little bit afterwards, and his heart seemed so pure. It seemed so good. And, and that just made me feel so good. And after they sang that song out of the, after it came up out of the water, whoo, man, it felt like the Holy Spirit just lit me up and I was maybe about halfway. <laughs> it felt good. It really did. Um, so we've got a comforter. We've got a teacher of all things. And, uh, and going back to the teacher of all things, I got distracted for a brief minute here. How do we know if the Holy Spirit is fully uh, speaking through us? The way I would say it is there's certain things that we can know, right? We can know, uh, we can know that if we're doing the right things, we follow his commandments. He's our friend. He's with us. But that getting at that 100% check mark and say 100% the Holy Spirit spoke through me, that's a, that's a dangerous mentality to me. That's very, very dangerous. You are now speaking for God. And I was talking about this earlier. Blaspheming the Holy Spirit says there's no sacrifice left for that person. If you're lying about this thing, if you said, 100% this spoke through me, and I'm wrong, that's one of the worst wagers you can make. Instead, rather than saying how much the Holy Spirit is speaking through me, with all humility, just say, God, I pray that you're with me during this service. I pray that you can give me wisdom. I pray that you can give me strength. I pray that you can encourage me. To what degree? I don't know. And sometimes that's the wisest thing you can say, is I don't know. It's very dangerous. So we should try to discourage people from saying 100% the Holy Spirit spoke through somebody. We should be so careful with that. I really do think so. I think that's a very dangerous route to go. Um, sometimes it's individuals who are newer to the church, and, they, and they're, they're feeling that power of the Holy Spirit. They're encouraged by it. They're seeing all the things that I can do. And they want to put that stamp of approval on it, that they have the Holy Spirit speaking through them. That's very dangerous. Be careful. Give that humility and humbleness to God. Say, God, you know best. I am weak, you are strong. Take on the humble route. I don't care how much you can bench press. I don't know how much you can squat. I don't care how much you make with your money. Don't put on the 100% stamp. That's God's will. Um, so he's a comfort. He's a teacher of all things. Uh, the third one brings to remembrance all things God has said to us. In John 14, 26, it says that he also has a memory 
role. So comforter, he has a teacher role. He has a remembrance role. In uh, John 16, 8, it talks about how he's a reprover. So that has to do with that correction step. He's also a creator. In Genesis chapter 1, we hear about, it says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the, of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So we know that he was there as well during the creation. The Spirit of God. He was part of that creation. He's also within us. We read about that earlier, about how he is dwelling within us. He's also a guider. John 16, 13 talks about how he guides us. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, has come, get this, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He says he shall not speak of himself. That's even more of a reason for this 100% approval. But he's not going to say, I'm speaking right now. That's not how it works, right? He's not going to say, this is the Holy Spirit speaking now. Here we go, I'm announcing this, this, this lesson to you. No, that's not how he works. He's a very, he has a very discreet role dwelling within us. He's also a testifier, John 15, 26. But when the comfort has come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. He testifies. Okay, so we know that he is, uh, one more reminder, a comforter, teacher of all things, brings to remembrance of all things. He's a reprover. He's a creator. He is within us. He is a guider. He's a testifier. That's eight. Eight things that just I could find off the top of my head. I'm sure there's probably a dozen things that this Holy Spirit can do. Do not put him in a box. He is fully God. He is fully God. And I think some of the reasons why people put him in a box is because they see the subjection that it goes the Father, then the Son, the Holy Spirit. Jesus answers to the Father. He always would answer to the Father. Everything was through the Father. And so the Father is on top. But that does not mean that the Son is any less valuable. He is still fully God. That means that the Father, he's also fully God. The Holy Spirit is also fully God. They claim them. They say that it's I. They claim that it's I. Okay, uh, the next one. It's interesting here because learning to love God more deeply also has to do with loving one another deeply. Isn't that interesting there? I need to love Calvin so I can love God. I need to love Kirsten so I can love God. I need to love Craig, all you guys. I need to love you guys so I can love God. If I've got this block in my heart, get this, it blocks it from getting to God. It's actually hindering us from, from loving God. And that is why we cannot have this hate on top of us. And if we do have that hate and we can't let it go, I know I, I'm guilty of it too, guys. Trust me. I, I'm guilty of it too. Sometimes you just can't let go of that hate. That person bothers you. Trust me, that's none of you guys. <laughs> that's not what I'm talking about. Uh, there's people that, that, man, they irritated me, got under my skin, and I just can't let it go. And I'm just like, God, help me find it. I can't find it. I'm weak and you're strong. Help me find it. Because I can't find this forgiveness. I must find that forgiveness in order to love God. And, uh, and the first one is God is love. Uh, to, to talk about that loving one another. 1 John 4 and 7 says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone that love, loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. So God is love. And then uh, another thing is that in order to love one another, I think we also have certain duties to one another. Um, Galatians chapter 6, it talks all about, and I won't read um, any explicit verses here, but it talks about carrying each other's burdens. If somebody becomes overtaken in a fault, they're, they're struggling with a sin, if we love them, won't we take care of them? If Calvin says, I'm struggling with a sin, Nathan, won't you give me a call? Won't you look after me? If Kirsten says, I, I can't get over this sin, it, it won't let go of me, then, uh, then maybe I can take care of her, look after her, uh, maybe support her in any way I can, encourage her, send her some Bible verses. I love when Craig sends me different texts. Uh, to me, I find that encouraging. There's a degree of fellowship with that, too. We're looking after one. We need to carry each other's burdens. Amen. And I know, I, I, and I've seen Calvin do this over and over. I can brag about for a minute. Calvin, he sees something in the way, he sees something bothering him. He goes, Calvin, help me out. And, and the, here comes Calvin over there to take care of it. I mean, it's just, it's very beautiful. I mean, this is that country love. <laughs> you look after each other out there. You got it. <laughs> um, 
I mean, I can see it. I can see you guys taking care of each other's burdens. That's pretty beautiful, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You can just give each other a call, and they're, and they're there. Another one is uh, that, that key verse, the loving your neighbor. Um, Matthew 22, verse 36 to 40. Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. The second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And these two commandments hang all the law of the prophets. They put it as that, that second great commandment, right? Um, another one I want to talk about is the, the, the difference between motivation and discipline. Uh, some of us that, when our Holy Spirit is down here, we're on empty. You know, we're running low and we're running on fumes and we're barely going to make it to that gas station. There's some things that we can do. I'm running a little low. I think I've been drawing a little bit too much. <laughs> uh, if you're running low, there's certain things that we need to do. Uh, there's two different aspects. There's motivation. This is something, for example, we'll, we'll, we'll apply this to weightlifting. This will be something completely outside, and we'll bring it back. So uh, in order, to, in order to, get, to get nice and buff like me, right? <laughs> I'm a bad example. Maybe like Jordan, my brother. Uh, you need to be motivated, right? And what do you do to get motivated? Maybe you need to lose weight. Maybe you want to, to, to go run a marathon. I don't know what your deal is, what you would like to do. Uh, for me, one of the ones was I wanted to run a half marathon, right? One of the things you can do is go on YouTube and watch some videos to motivate yourself. You've got to get that fire sparked up. You can also do it with Bible videos. You can look at different preachers doing different things. Maybe you can pull up on your phone. You can do different things that spark your motivation. Maybe you can talk to one of your brethren who can carry one of your burdens. This is motivation. This is that spark, that thing that gets you back, back and, and ignites your love again. But then, that motivation, it doesn't last, does it always? <laughs> and some people, they, they go like this. They go, whoop, I'm back to going on, then I go down. Then you go back up, then you go down. That's motivation bumping you up and down, and you're just depending on motivation. And that's where discipline needs to come in. Discipline is that steady line, that thing that you always do, and motivation is the thing that can always keep bumping you back up. There's no problem with motivation. That's the thing that can get you back to the discipline stage. When I was at the healthiest point in my life, when I was just like, oh, I feel good, it was because I said, I would rather die than miss the gym three times a week. I said, I must go to the gym three times a week. And you know what? I ended up going five times a week for about a straight year. It felt so good. This is not the right myself. I'm struggling with all the I've been eating chips nonstop. It's, this is where I need to get back. I'll confess that. This is where I'd like to get back to. Um, so three days a week, I said, I would rather die than, than miss it. And I was determined. That was my discipline. I must be at the gym three times. And every time I'd go a number above, if I got four times in the gym or five times, Oh, that felt good. It felt like I went, I exceeded beyond expectations. It's kind of like when I do my reading Bible plan. Christian and I are trying to read the Bible in here. I'm, I'm a little behind right now. Um, but anytime I, I go past where it says, it says, oh, you only need to read up to, say, May 8th. And then I'm like, oh, I went to May 10th? That feels good. It sure does. That was a little bit of discipline and a little bit of motivation to bump me up as well, right? So we need to consider those things. And I want you to evaluate yourself. And I want you to go home and say, why am I not reading? Why am I not praying? Am I lacking motivation? Am I lacking discipline? Or am I lacking both? First thing I would say, find something that motivates you. Find that thing that gets you, that jump starts you back up and gets you to start reading again. Whatever it might be. You might say, hey, Kirsten, you know, I want you to encourage me. I want you to once a night say, we are going to read. We are going to listen to it. Maybe while we brush our teeth. Maybe that would be our thing to, to, to motivate us. You can use your partner, your, your spouse, whatever it might be. Even your kids, they can motivate you as well. And then you want to get on some sort of track where you can consistently do that thing. And I know that when I see that days, they'll say, you're this many days behind. <laughs> I have to stay to that discipline because I can see how many days behind I am in my reading plan. When it says, you know, you're on April 13th and it's May, you're like, oh, bummer. I've got to get back to my discipline, right? So that's motivation discipline. I want you to evaluate yourself. I can't do this for you. This is the step you need to look at yourself and say, how do I get myself back to being disciplined in reading? I imagine all of us at one point, um, and it could be very, right now, we're reading very consistently. That is part of it. Uh, the next part is prayer and fasting. One of my favorite uh, verses is it says, in Matthew 17, 21, it says, Howbeit this time goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. 
So this person, they were possessed of, of this wicked spirit, and they, and they could not get rid of it. And it says, and they were trying, the disciples were trying and trying and trying to kick that spirit out. And Jesus tells them, he says, the reason you're unsuccessful is because you need to do it by prayer and fasting. There's a degree of fasting can support you in this world. And prayer, those two are very powerful tools in our arsenal. And that's all I had in the lesson. Um, the last thing I wanted us to think about was that motivation discipline. Evaluate yourself. Really, really do that. I can't do it for you. Um, that's the biggest step is, is to recognize how am I going to fuel that, that tank. And I want you to think of the Holy Spirit like a gas tank. Pump it back up. Whatever you need to do to get it back up and get yourself right on track. And if you lose that discipline, you lose that motivation, that's all right. Get back on track. Get back on track. That is why Jesus died for, all, for us on the cross. Because when we stumble, we can always come back. He's just a word away. He's just a prayer away. And we can get right back on track. I never want any lessons. I'm going to the plan of salvation, which is to hear, believe, repent of our sins, confess that Jesus Christ is the only God, um, and then be baptized. If anybody would like to take part in this step um, or would like to praise the church, they can come forward as we sing the song of invitation. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest friend, but only lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock, I stand with all of the ground in a sinking sky.